Now the coelacanth is a fish. Uh, fossils have been found of this fish that the evolutionists say um, died out, say, 70 million years ago, uh, came on the scene about 400 million years ago. The reality is, in 1938, off of the island of Madagascar, fishermen started catching coelacanths. And so now the evolutionist is presented with a problem. If coelacanths died out 75 million years ago, What's a live one doing in 1938? And they found a lot more of them. Some are even in aquariums today. According to conventional wisdom, the dinosaurs lived from about uh, 250 million years ago to about 65 million years ago. The reason not why they say that is after the so-called Cretaceous layers, you don't find any more dinosaur fossils above there. And so they believe the dinosaurs were wiped out 65 million years ago. And they believe that man only evolved in the last two million years, say, because we only find human fossils at the very top of the layers. And so man and dinosaurs, in their view, could never have lived together because they would be separated by over 60 million years. An evolutionist would look at the fossil record and they would, based on their, their idea that the Earth is ancient and that the present is the key to the past, and they would look at natural processes which act very slowly they would say, therefore, the fossil record must have accumulated very slowly. And because it's such a slow process, it's actually, a, a, you can look at it and look at different eras of time. And so in, in this section, these fossils are buried. That means that these fossils are alive at one point in time. And then a, if there's a layer that appears above that, well, that must be a later period of time. There's a different set of fossils being buried there. That's a snapshot of a different period of time. And then they build this very elaborate tree structure of all of life, and they build this very elaborate uh, model of, of the geologic record. Well, basically what they do is look at the sedimentary rock units in the Jurassic layer, and they find some dinosaurs there, and they say, because we find dinosaurs here, this particular layer is at least 70, 75 million years old. And so it is a tautology where they date the fossils by the rock layers and they ba they date the rock layers by the fossils that they find in them and so it is a a cause for circuitous or circular reasoning i did one year of geology in the uh, my university and it's interesting that the head of the department uh, said um, the fossil record does not support darwinian evolution he said this plainly he made it clear he was not a creationist but he did say the fossil record seems support to support a series of divine creation this I heard from the professor of geology, and professor in New, in New Zealand was the highest rank of, of uh, university teachers, not just any old lecturer. Well, fossils are formed only under special circumstances. Um, I've, I, I'm a marine biologist. I'm a scuba diver. I've, oh, I lost count after about 500 scuba dives. And it's funny because most people think marine biologists study whales and dolphins, but really most marine biologists study worms and bacteria and mud. And so in my my life I've studied a lot of mud I've, I've dug mud in lakes rivers and streams all over the southeast um, all, all looked at the sediments all up and down the Florida Keys over in the Bahamas in in Belize uh, one one trip to the South Pacific which was very nice and all that digging and all that sand and all that dirt and all that mud I've never found a fish skeleton I've never found an incipient fossil I've never seen found something that was being fossilized because fish when they die if when they finally do hit the bottom they're eaten by everything. And usually um, they're eaten on the way down. And so their, their bones tend to be scattered all over the place and, and their flesh is, is destroyed. And even if they land in the mud, the bones dissolve over time in the water They're made of calcium carbonate is soluble in seawater. Uh, it, it, it really, it takes special circumstances to make a fossil. And most of those circumstances are met by Noah's flood, where you have a very rapid amount of sedimentation we have lots of fossils being buried very quickly, being sealed off away from oxygen, and then being impregnated by the minerals that dissolved in the water that can recrystallize inside those bones, prevent them from dissolving away, and you get a, a fossil. I believe those dinosaurs were uh, uh, buried in sediment at the time of Noah's flood, which would have been about 4,000 years ago. So either at the time of the flood or at some point after the flood, during the runoff, because all the dinosaurs that we know of, with rare exception, are buried in water-deposited sediment. As Ken Ham says, if there really was a worldwide flood, you'd expect to see billions of things buried in 
rock layers deposited by water all over the earth. And what you really see are billions of dead things buried in rock layers deposited by water all over the earth. And that is certainly true of the dinosaurs. And when you read about them, they always are, are described as having wandered too close to an inland sea or lake, and maybe got a little tipsy and fell in. And before their flesh could rot, before scavengers could eat it, uh, they became encased in a very cementitious rock. This isn't going on today. I have rabbits and squirrels in my backyard. I don't know what happens to them when they die. I've never seen any little rabbit funerals or anything like that. And I'll tell you, they're certainly not making fossils. You can't get a fossil. If you, a dinosaur died uh, in the, the forest, it's going to uh, rot away and get scavenged. And you can see that in the farms today. You don't see uh, sheep and cattle fossilized. You have to bury them quickly. And when you have something uh, like the, a global flood, you're going to bury lots of creatures. And that's why we find um, lots of fossil dinosaur graveyards where they've been washed in the, the, the Guanadon graveyard. It makes sense if you've got a huge catastrophe, uh, a watery catastrophe. And of course, when you have a watery catastrophe, you don't need millions of years to explain the rock layers either. Right behind me is what is called a polystrait fossil. Poly meaning many, straight meaning strata. So here's a fossil that is straight up and down, going through many layers of strata. And what is significant about that? Well, first off, the conventional wisdom around here in uh, the Hell Creek Formation is that it could take a thousand years uh, a centimeter to lay down all of the uh, uh, sedimentary deposits. Well, is that uh, polystrate fossil behind me gonna wait around for 100,000 years while slowly all of the uh, sediment is uh, put in around it to hold it straight up? No, it's gonna decompose, gonna fall over long before that happened. It had to have been done very, very quickly. There are some fish fossils that I've seen with exquisite preservation. All the scales, all the fins are intact. The, the fish's mouth is closed. His gills are closed, which is an indication that he's buried in squish. In fact, the, the streamlines around the fish and the mud, it looks like he was struggling and trying to swim as he's being buried. We've got abundant evidence of rapid fossilization. There's some three-dimensional dinosaurs that are preserved where a dinosaur is crouching down, and yet he's covered in mud. And the only way to do that is if the mud is accumulating so quickly that he's literally suffocated in the mud because if he had died, he would have fallen over, or at least would have laid down flat. But no, he's crouching. The mud covers all the way up above his head. And Mount St. Helens is certainly an excellent example because we saw things happen there that blew geologists' mind. Uh, May 1980, the eruption of Mount St. Helens, and the next, uh, you know, in, in that major eruption and subsequent ones, up to 600 feet of rock layers new material was deposited around Mount St Helens and at one particular level we find a 20-foot horizon that was produced on June 12, 1980. We, we know the day and the year because people were there to observe it so it's testable you know we've got we've got reliable eyewitness accounts but within that 20-foot thick layer we have multiplicity of small layers alternating coarse and fine banded coarse and fine-grained layers. Now, a geologist normally looking at that with a millions of years belief system, we call it mental glasses, looking through the idea of millions of years, who would have thought that each of those little bands would have taken thousands of years to accumulate, or, you know, alternating yearly, yearly sequences. And so the whole sequence, hundreds of them, would have taken hundreds of years. But we observed it to happen in just one day. The rock layers are not a sequence of age, but a sequence of burial. Taking their age interpretation, they shouldn't be, the sea the camps have died out, yet we know they're living today. People will ask, why are there no dinosaur and humans fossilized together? Well, I would ask, why are there no sea camps and whales fossil together, even though they live in the sea together? It's because they just weren't buried together. Now, how do you explain that by slow and gradual processes with little local floods over millions of years? Now, only a global flood can explain rock layers with marine fossils up on the continents that were catastrophically deposited and buried that swept right across the continents and, and between continents. I mean, the evidence is crying out for catastrophe. It screams Noah's flood, it therefore screams a young Earth. You know, radiometric dating is seen as the linchpin of, of the evolutionary age of the Earth. They say, oh, all these radiometric dating techniques show the Earth is ancient, so how can you believe in a young Earth? Well, actually, what I do is I, I appeal to 
known lava flows. Go to Hawaii, sample a lava flow, sample some basalt that's come out of the earth, bring it back to your laboratory, tell me what age you measure. It's not going to be zero. It's not going to be even a few thousand years old. You're going to get an old age. Uh, it doesn't matter what technique you use. So what that does is that takes the idea that you can measure the difference between the daughter product and the parent product and calculate an age as if there was a clock. That discredits anything that, that's using the assumption that there's zero daughter products. Well, I was involved in a project called the RITE project, R-A-T-E. It stands for Radioisotopes and the Age of the Earth. It was an acronym that we put together to describe so people could quickly identify uh, what this project was. And, and it was uh, conducted uh, between 1997 and 2005. And we got some exciting e evidences that confirm that the conclusion we came to was that it, the nuclear decay rates, radioactive decay rates, had been grossly accelerated at some time or times in the past. At some event, the decay rates had been accelerated, that had been speeded up to such an enormous extent that you could essentially have hundreds of millions of years worth of nuclear decay measured by the rates at which they occur today, all of that happening within a few thousand years. So one of the best examples we came up with, well there are several good ones, there were tiny crystals found in a granite in New Mexico from a drill hole. And uh, essentially when uranium decays to lead, the parent decays to the, Lord, to the daughter lead, the byproduct is helium. And helium gas is it, it's not, it's chemically stable, it, it doesn't re react with other elements, it's an, what we call an inert element or inert gas. And because it's only got small atoms, it could leak very easily out of those crystals. But we found that the uranium lead date for these crystals, suppose, you know, with the millions of years scenario, using the radioisotope dating, was one and a half billion years. But most of the helium that would have been produced by that amount of nuclear decay was still in the crystals. So we, we made predictions. Then we sent the crystals to a well-recognized laboratory who, who was well known for doing that work to actually measure the rate of leakage. And what, where did it fit? Exactly on the 6,000 year prediction. In other words, while the uranium to lead clock had ticked at the rate of 1.5 billion years, that's 1,500 million years, while uranium had been ticking through that rate, Helium had been leaking at a different rate. That means because we know of the law of leakage of these atoms, well-known physical law that we can reproduce in the laboratory, that was a far more credible age determination method. There's a, some basalt flows that, that erupted uh, on the rim of the Grand Canyon, flowed down into the canyon all the way to the base of the canyon. That means that the, the lava flow is younger than the canyon younger than the, the uppermost sediments and yet that lava flow dates to millions of years older than the canyon itself it really raises the question how do we know that these techniques are valid we've got other lines of evidence there was about three or four lines of evidence that we found that all pointed in the same direction that the assumption of nuclear decay rates always being constant at the rates we measure today isn't true that they were accelerated in the past, and that means the clocks can't be trusted. We have done carbon-14 dating on coal and diamonds, which are hugely old. Diamonds are supposed to be over a billion years old, and yet we find carbon-14 in them. Now, hang on, carbon-14 would have long just decayed if they were that old. One of the uh, discoveries that has really rocked the evolutionary world was made by Dr. Mary Schweitzer and Dr. Jack Horner uh, from analyzing the uh, interior, uh, the bone marrow, if you will, uh, of the thigh bone or the femur of a T-Rex that was excavated back in 2003. Their report was published in the March-April uh, 2005 edition of Science Magazine, a very prestigious peer-reviewed Science Magazine. And they reported, and to my left, our pictures, uh, just a few pictures, there's many more that were actually in the magazine, they reported soft, stretchable, elastic, snapback like a rubber band tissue in that thigh bone. In addition, they reported finding red blood vessels, uh, blood vessels that still had blood cells in them that were identifiable, and all of that would be impossible if 
this dinosaur died out 65 to 68 million years ago. Clearly, science has shown this dinosaur died out very recently, and I would say perhaps as a result of the flood of Noah's day, just a matter of, say, 4,000 years ago. Doctors Mary Schweitzer and Jack Horner are paleontologists. They study fossils. Specifically, they're interested in dinosaurs. In fact, I think you could call Jack Horner Mr. Dinosaur. I mean, he's probably associated with the study of dinosaurs as much or more than anyone else that comes to mind. Mary Schweitzer said that on one such test, she said she couldn't believe it until she'd done it 17 times. This is pretty thorough. So most people are, are understandably shocked, and that includes certainly evolutionists, uh, that you should find what appears to be fresh marrow. Still soft, still with blood vessels, still with red blood cells. More recently, they've gone beyond that. Schweitzer, working with other investigators, have looked at the biochemistry of the marrow, and they have indeed found protein fragments. Now, not the whole protein, but protein fragments. Proteins usually don't remain completely undisturbed for uh, a few thousand years, and of course we have no idea for 70 million. Well, of course, the evolutionary naturalist who adhere, who embrace the long ages of evolution, who maintain adamantly that man and dinosaur are separate by 65 million years, are very, very uncomfortable with these continuing discoveries of Mary Schweitzer. Tom Kay of Seattle, who was also a critic of the first study of Mary Schweitzer, said, and I quote, this will either be nothing or the biggest revolution in paleontology ever. You know, I would have to agree with the, the latter portion of his quote. This is one of the greatest paleontological discovers, uh, discoveries ever. Kids have been to see those movies uh, that uh, talk about dinosaurs. They might be fictional movies uh, like Jurassic Park and so on, but at the same time, they still teach millions of years. Ever since Darwin and Lyell, that this idea of many, many millions of years is a philosophical necessity, but is certainly not found in science. The main movers and shakers at the time were really striving to discredit the Bible. I mean, Lyell himself said that his stated goal was to free the world from Moses. And if that's a stated goal to free the world from Moses, he is actively trying to undermine the biblical account, biblical account of creation. Paleontologists uh, also, I believe, go ahead and uh, fill in the gaps as they see them in the evolutionary timeline, going from monkeys to man, going from uh, microbes to man. One of the things that they find, though, in the process of doing that is that life is very complex. Whether it's dead life or living life, it is still extremely complex. And so that means they've got to have huge amounts of time in order to give people any idea at all that um, it's credible to go from microbes to man. And that's really, time is the magic bullet for the evolutionist. It's a lot of time which makes the impossible possible. Old Earth, uh, old universe even, but certainly old Earth, 4.5 billion years, is important to the evolutionist uh, because they need a great deal of time for things to evolve by the evolutionary process, which would involve random changes due to mutations uh, and natural selection. I would suggest it requires infinitely more time than the pittance of 4.5 billion years. I encourage them to think along the lines of Google years. That would be to the Google power. I mean, you need years that make billions look like nothing if you're going to try to attribute to chance uh, even a single biologically useful protein. Well, they say that over billions of years anything is possible, but would you ever expect someone to win the lottery every single day for 10 years straight? That's essentially the, the odds that they're claiming anything is possible. If that happened, a court of law would call that guy guilty, send him to jail for the rest of his life because he's cheating. Even if they don't know how he's cheating, they would have to conclude that you are cheating because this is impossible. So their, their idea that anything is possible is really ridiculous on the, face of, on the face of it. Would require more time and material than is in the known universe to have ever evolved by chance. Uh, once you can buy all that and accept it, once you can accept photosynthesis having formed by chance, I don't see a hill of beans difference between believing it happened by chance in 6,000 years versus 6 billion years.
I mean, one's just as improbable as the other. We've reached a point where the p-values are so low that what's the difference? But evolutionists know that their arguments would be even less tenable to laymen if the times were shortened too much for them. We say humans are very complicated and, and a sponge or a jellyfish would be very non-complicated. Uh, but it's really funny because a, a jellyfish, or at least the, the sea anemone, has got about the same number of protein coding genes as people. So in all these billions of years of supposed evolution, we actually haven't increased the number of genes hardly at all. And a lot of the genes that they have that we thought at first was, was something specific to vertebrates or specific to higher life forms, they have them also. So the evolution is scratching their head. The simplest cell is utterly complex. The simplest life out there is so mind-bogglingly complex that it's, it's, it, to me, it's impossible to conceive that it just spontaneously evolved from random chemicals. There, there is an unbridgeable gap between the simplest cell and random chemistry. It's sort of like saying, um, oh, well, we can find, if you go out in nature, you can find a rock sitting on top of another rock, just from natural processes, you know, maybe fell off the cliff and landed on top of another rock. And because you can find rocks sitting on top of rocks, that explains the Great Pyramids. Well, of course, that's ridiculous. Uh, we have decay. We have the second law of thermodynamics. Uh, I look in the mirror every day, and it's hitting me with a vengeance. Uh, yeah, we've been told that if our theories ever run counter to the second law, we can be pretty sure they're not right. Uh, the second law basically tells us that at least a uh, closed system, everything goes downhill. Uh, things fall apart. They don't spontaneously self-assemble over the long haul. The evolutionist tries to get out of this by arguing that the Earth is an open system, that energy keeps impacting on the Earth from the sun, and that this energy sort of drives the uh, evolution uphill and causes entropy then to decrease rather than increase. This is really not a good argument. We know that energy is necessary for the assembly of complex things. That's true in an automobile plant. Without energy, the plant comes to a halt. But uh, energy by itself is a necessary but not sufficient condition of, say, making automobiles. One needs information, you need programs, you need sequences. Things have to be done in a certain order. Parts have to arrive at a certain time, have to fit other parts. There's an integration of complexity. Energy alone is not sufficient to explain it. The Achilles heel in evolutionary theory is a lack of transitional species. There should be millions of transitional species. There should be tremendous numbers of transitional species between the major groups of animals, but there aren't. In fact, you've got the Cambrian explosion where all the major phyla of life, the biggest differences that exist, they just poof, appear out of nowhere with no transitional species. You've got, um, you know, Darwin saying that he's, he's leaving up to future generations of geologists to, to discover all the innumerable transitional species that must exist. But since the 1960s, the fossil records changed by about 4%. So what they have is a handful of disputable transitional species. Uh, those transitional species they use today were not the ones they used in the 1970s. It's not the ones they used at the 1925 Scopes trial. It's not the ones that Charles Darwin had in his, in his day. Each transitional species seems to have a shelf life of maybe 10 years. And then it's kind of quietly shuffled off to the side and they think of something else and something else is brought up as a transitional species. I mean, you had the, the famous evolution of the horse series. Everyone remembers that, the little horse or the big horse. That's not found in, in, the, in the textbooks anymore. And if it is, it shouldn't be because that's been routinely and soundly discredited. And a lot of the other things that, that people would remember as the best evidence for evolution uh, really turned out to be no evidence at all. Charles Darwin did the same thing when he thought up his idea of evolution. He saw that the facts of the fossil record did not line up with his theory, and so he made a very unscientific decision. He decided to hold on to his theory and ignore the facts. The same thing happened in the 21st century. Mary Schweitzer said in Discover Magazine, April of 2006, quote, I had one reviewer tell me he didn't care what the data said. He knew that what I was finding wasn't possible. I wrote back and said, well, what data would convince you? And he said, none, end quote. And so here's a perfect example of where people are saying, I have my unproved theory of evolution that spans many, many millions of years where there's no creator, no designer, it's just time, chance, and natural processes, but the facts don't line up with it. I'd rather hold on to the, uh, the uh, theory than the facts. Many of the opponents of young earth creationism point to young earth creationists as 
being the enemies of science, that they don't think rationally and they actually stop good science being done. In fact, when you look at the uh, really great breakthroughs of science in recent decades, very often you'll find those who made those breakthroughs were uh, Christians and uh, certainly understood the God of creation. I mean, who can we name uh, bigger, more influential than Isaac Newton? He was a Bible-believing Christian, Pasteur, Kepler. I mean, we're not just talking about mere Nobel Prize winners. We're talking about people that opened up whole areas of science. Boyle, Maxwell, Faraday, George Washington Carver, Louis Pasteur, all of these men of science who are also men of God, who believe that in the beginning, God created. So many people think it's the religion versus science. No, it's, it's the science built on one religion versus the science built on a different religion. And see, I start with a belief that God's word is true, that we have reliable eyewitness accounts of what happened in the past, therefore I build my science on that. Whereas an evolutionist has a belief in millions of years with no God, just everything happening slowly and gradually, and now he builds his science on that. What, what most people have to decide which view is correct. Well, I was an atheist all the way through university uh, because I believed that everything made itself, because I believed in the millions of years and so on, and, and it was obvious that the history and the Bible um, that the gospel depended upon that, that if evolution in millions of years were right, what the Bible was teaching just didn't make sense. It was only when somebody gave me a book that explained how I could look at the same facts and interpret them logically and rationally in a way that was not only intellectually satisfying, but that fitted the Bible and that actually made more sense than the evolutionary long ages point of view, that I could become a Christian. Today's scientific geological discoveries are confirming that processes that used to be thought to take literally hundreds of thousands or millions of years can be done very quickly, which supports the sudden creation, it supports the flood of Noah's day, and is adding additional support to the true history of the Bible. Your knowledge about the Creator it is testified by the creation itself. The creationists, the scriptures, the heavens declare the glory of God. The, 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 whether you're talking about astronomy or microscopy, the, our, the frontiers of science bear testimony to design. And that design is sufficient to hold us accountable. The Bible stands on its own, but from science, we can really establish that it's true. We can find confirmation of it. We can find the evidence that it really did happen just that way. I had actually, uh, I guess, really felt that I was really something special because I could tell God how he did it. I had put God in a box and I'd say, yeah, God, you started out, but this is exactly how you did it. You used evolution. Now, I just, when that was pointed out to me, it hit me right between the eyes. Boy, how arrogant. And then he started pointing out the evidence, much of the evidence uh, we've been talking about uh, uh, today. And this evidence is just stacking up, proving that the Bible is true. The point is the creator himself who did all this entered his creation and fulfilled a mission that we were unable to fulfill for ourselves. And he did it on our behalf. That's the staggering discovery that awaits the person who's seriously interested in trying to find out what it's all about.